Well, my name is Henry Greenwood. I'm known as Harry Greenwood. Uh, I'm going to be 93 in April. And I'm ret obviously retired and still have much of my health. And I'm a very active person. Well, remembering that I was just barely out of school and I had started to work in the newspaper office, so that's what I was. I was like I'm running around learning everything. I had an interest in editorial writing and so I stuck around that desk mostly. But I was uh, the boy in the office, so I did all the things that were necessary. And I went into the, I went into the Navy at 17 and three months shortly after. So I didn't have much of an occupation bef between leaving school and going into the Navy. Actually, I grew up with a very, in a very progressive family. And so I was very much aware of what had happened in the First World War. I had lost an uncle. In, in that war, he died. Uh, his, his death certificate says France and Flanders. And my father, who was too young to go into the services, he, he was an active person. He belonged to the Independent Labour Party, so he insisted in a lot of ways that I join young socialist movements. But I had a lot of thoughts about the First World War because I saw the, the results of it the physical results in human beings. Many people were, there was no prosthetics then, and many people were walking about in crutches, lost a leg, lost an arm, gassed, blinded, uh, begging. I, I lived in Scotland, as you can hear, hear from my accent, part of the British Empire. And I say the British Empire because that's the way they looked upon themselves as being part of the British Empire. We had always been to war always fighting wars. It started with the Crimea, the South Africa War, the, everything else. But I felt the First World War was a, a war of kings. It wasn't a war of reasons. It was a war of kings. It was a slaughterhouse. And I learned that very soon. And I, and I had, as I say, I witnessed that very soon. So I had very mixed feelings about it. And very mixed feelings about the First World War because I, quite frankly, didn't understand it. It wasn't to regain territory and then it was, at the end of the war, there was a division of countries that set this, the mood for the Second World War. And the, the countries were divided by cultures. The, the, the defeated nations, had the lands taken from them, which meant that they were always ready to fight for, to get them back, which was a result of the Second World War. But I'm not an imperialist, and I felt that the First World War was a war to preserve the, the land for kings. That's really all it was about. It was a slaughterhouse. When you think of Flanders and you think of France, you think of Vimy, you think of Passchendaele, we just felt it was like it was like an exhibition in the middle of a soccer field. You just felt like going back and forward, back and forward, back and forward, taking no land except to defeat somebody, and then they would come back. It was like a game. It was a war game. That's how I felt about it. Ah, and now that's a different question because, as I said, I came from a progressive family so I knew all about the rise of fascism, I knew all about the, what was happening after Versailles. I could, and I, again, I had visible signs of this because I lived in a country close to Europe and seeing the refugees coming in, refugees in my own class as a boy from Germany, from other countries, many Jewish people coming over who were been racially exploited. And so I knew that this was an evil 
situation and I was, I was against it. So I, I knew that this war would be to preserve man's rights. In the midst of all this, fascism raised its head quite often in Italy, with Mussolini invading Abyssinia, as it was called then, invading Albania, with Germany invading the Ruhr, walking into, annexing Austria, walking into Czechoslovakia, and then Poland. So I was very much aware that this was something we had to stop. And so I was in favour of the war. Well, I can't really answer that, how they felt about it, but many of them, many of them had no knowledge of why they were there. They were there because it was a war run and they felt it was patriotic to come and fight. And it was. It was patriotic to come and fight. And I made many friends, talked to many people, served with many people who had different ideas from me about the war. I, I didn't believe the propaganda that we were fighting for a better country. I don't think we were fighting for a better country at all because the post-war years proved that we didn't fight for a better country. We still had we still had rationing in the UK at that time, and I'm talking about my country, but we had rationing in the UK right up until 1957. The war finished in 1945. We had, we had get into so much debt caused by the war, and we'll continue to we no longer were an empire, but we acted as if we had an empire. We still took part in all the wars that were going on. And I, I left the UK in 1951 and came to Canada to get away from that system because it was a, and it still is in many ways, a, 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 a class system. So we have just transported that now to this country where we have a different type of class system, you know. But I think deeply of many things. I, I, I think of my friends who believed that they came from the slums of places like Glasgow and Liverpool and Manchester and London. And m many of these places were bombed out. They came back from the war. They were pretty well homeless. They were, they were now at an age of getting married and trying to find houses for themselves. There was no building programs of any great extent going on. And they left squalor in many cases and returned to squalor. And that wasn't what they were promised. And it was for these reasons I left the UK. I, I had definite reasons for leaving the UK. No, I didn't feel it then. I feel it now. I feel it now. I feel like now living in an area like this where people who are born here can't afford to live here. I feel it now when I see that we, are, we talk about homeless people and we talk about the hundreds of thousands of homeless people across the country and yet we talk in digits of tens and, and hundreds uh, to repatriate them from homelessness into social housing instead of putting our efforts into social housing. These are radical thoughts in this country because we're no longer, we're no longer interested in people, we're interested in wealth. Wealth. Well, as I say, I felt in the Second World War I was fighting for something. And looking back in the Second World War, I still feel we were fighting for something. We did defeat fascism. But we continued to involve ourselves. Let me just say, in 19, at the end of 1944, the representatives of the United States, the United Kingdom, China, France, and the Soviet Union met in San Francisco. And they met there to hammer out 
a charter for the United Nations. These are the basic tenets of the United Nations. And that charter was to provide world peace through world law. Not world peace through extending world wars and arms. It was a contradiction to think, think that we were talking about world peace through world law, but we were really saying world peace through rearmament. And that's, that's when I started getting involved with the, the CND, Canadian Against Nuclear War. I got involved with the anti-apartheid movement that saw what was happening in South Africa. And I get very much involved in all protests against war. That, that was how, how I, I came here. I saw that what we were promised as a result of the Second World War, by the way, as I said earlier, I was in favor of the Second World War, but the promises that were made to give us reason for fighting in the Second World War were promises that have never been kept. We still have fascism. We have more today to be afraid of than we had before the, first, the Second World War. Well, I'm afraid of a terrorism. Don't know who they are. And it seems like it's, it seems like it's contagious. I just don't understand it. It's a holy war that's been fought, jihad. But yet, it's not people who believe in religion who are fighting it. They're taking advantage of the fact that it's a holy war. Using religion, dividing cultures, dividing religions. People are starting to talk about the Muslims being the enemy. And this is dangerous. This is exactly what happened in Germany and in Europe when they talked about the Jews being the danger. So we've now come to that. And I'm disappointed, very disappointed, in many of my comrades. Comrades is the word we use in the region, by the way. And many of my comrades who still perpetuate the idea that Muslims and Jews are something that we should be a little bit wary of. Even today, I can't understand that. I, I raise questions like, why don't we have a, a rabbi speaking at the memorial service? And I was shut down on that because that's not it. Yeah, when you go to the cemeteries of Europe, you see the Jewish stones. We seem to ignore that. We have come to a point now where bigotry seems to be around a lot. I hear it every day here in West Vancouver. I hear people saying things about the Iranians and the Chinese. And it's, it's, a, it's a repeat. It's like it's come around. I'm now at a stage where I can, I say quite seriously that every day now is deja vu. Well, it would be, it would be as the United Nations said it. One of the men who, one of the men who in, at the end of 1944 in the San Francisco talks was a guy called Hector McNeil. He was, he was one of the delegates from the UK. And when he was asked what he felt the United Nations would achieve, he said, well, he said, it gives me a vision. He said, it gives me a vision that one day our mother will look from her kitchen window onto a large green meadow with wild flowers and see the children of all colors, races, and creeds hopping and playing together. Well, I still share that vision, but it's a long way gone. So that's what I felt the Second World War would achieve. It would achieve peace. It would, it would get rid of bigotry because that's what started it.
there's always a role in promoting peace. Yeah, always. Because as I've said it so many, many times, there's nothing romantic about war, but there's a lot romantic about peace. And peace, peace is what we were born to live in, not war. Although as man, we fought wars since the beginning of time. Even in Christianity, we fought wars. And then before Christianity, we fought wars. Mythology is all wars. History is all wars. It's like we're predators. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think I've said this to you before that the, the war completely disrupts society. It causes everything that's good in society to be turned bad. Family life fails. Marriage life fails. And we take it as we celebrate it. We celebrate promiscuity. We, we celebrated infidelity. We celebrated it. There's not, a, there's not a man of my generation who can say that he did not take advantage of these disruptions in society because they were forced on us. It was a case of we might not be here tomorrow attitude. And we saw that, it was evident, you know, the people of London, the people of Glasgow, the people of Coventry who had been under bombing attacks, they never in their life imagined that their families would be wiped out by bombs. They thought they would have a natural life. And when that happens, you've disrupted the whole system. And you live in a disrupted society and you take advantage of it. No, it was still broken. It was the after effects of it were broken. Uh, it, it takes a long time for a, a family to heal if it has been disrupted. And uh, it was still in the same generations. When I was leaving, I could still hear people say, well, so-and-so was played around during the war, or so-and-so did this during the war. And, and so-and-so has got a house, and why did they get a house? They must know someone. You know, everyone was, everyone was competing with everyone else to, to try and make a living. And that's what I found. It's difficult to explain it, but it's, you know, going back, it is difficult to explain it. People actually, believe it or not, used to look at the obituaries and go to the house where the person had died and ask if somebody had was taken the house. They did. Sounds terrible, but they did. As I say, society was totally disrupted. And yet, society flourished as far as their social life went because they took advantage of it. It was like Solomon and Gomorrah. Not to that extent. Well, I grew up a lot different. I, as I say, I became very active in fighting for the things we were promised. I took part in anti-war demonstrations. I took part in all sorts of things. I think I was a bit of a rebel. Of course, you know that now, don't you? Yeah, I became very more active, much more active than I did before I went in. And 
I was brought up. In, I was brought up in a very good family, and I I like to everyone to know that because the one thing I believe that we should give credit to our parents, and I give lots and lots of credit to my parents, and I'm finding myself talking more about them today than I ever did. I don't know why. I don't know if it's a generational thing. It's just getting old. But the fact is that when I think of my family, they were so far ahead. Progressively, of what I'm seeing today, and I, I remark on that. We we talk we talk about that with my daughter too. You know, that we we brought her up to respect their values. We brought her up to respect their values, and I look around today and I see that that's not the case of all families. They don't respect the values of the parents at all. My wife is going for a walk this afternoon with my daughter. My daughter's 50. She just got back from Tokyo because she's got a job that takes her all over the world. But she's going for a walk with my wife this afternoon. And she, comes, she never misses a Sunday when she's home to come to dinner. Because we still have a very strong family compact. And that's because of our parents, not because of, of us. And I don't see that anymore. And that, that's sad. That's sad. I am not anti-progressive as far as technology goes, but I see the disadvantages of it. For example, I used to, I used to drive over in the bus, and I enjoyed driving in the bus because I'm, I'm very much open, and I would immediately start talking to my, <clears throat> my fellow passenger. But I don't do that anymore because when I go into the bus, my fellow passengers get this, things stuck in his ears and his texts and something like that. So the whole society has gone to a point where we, we no longer interact in conversation with each other. You know. And that's too bad. And I think about that a lot. It's interesting, my daughter says to me, talked to me the other night about, about words. <clears throat> she asked about the word through. And uh, she started journalism school too at Carlton. She says, tell me why we say through, T-H-R-O-U-G-H, when we say B-R-O-U-G-H is brought. And T-H-O-U-G-H is thought. What makes the O-U? Why do we say that? She, she asks me questions when she's writing, see? I'm supposed to have the answers. But it's interesting, we still have conversations about, about little things. We still talk about, we still talk about philosophy. It's interesting because I heard a little story about LOL, see? And when I first saw that, I'm, 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 I'm not quite a Luddite, but I used to be. When and I always thought LOL meant lots of love. Until my daughter says, no, Dad, it means laughing out loud. So I thought that's very interesting. So I happened to read a little bit lately about a teacher in the school who asked the class what LOL meant. And they all said laughing out loud. He said, write it down. And only five people had it got correct. The rest all had L-E-F-F-I-N-G or L-E-F-I-N-G. <laughs> So society's changing, and I'm getting older. <laughs> People I met who hadn't been in the war, I, I, I couldn't interact with them anymore. We had led different lives. I went, in, I went into the, in 1942, and I came out in the beginning of 1947, so close enough to four and a half, five years. And in that time, I had grown up from boyhood into manhood. So had they. But it was a different growing up if they hadn't gone to war. Their growing up was still home life, entertainment, dancing, regular girlfriends, regular friends, parents to come home to. Mine was. Seeing war, and I'm not going to, and I saw a lot of war, 
because I was in convoy duties and I was in rescue, so I pulled many men out of the sea, helped to sew them up in bags and then dump them over again. And that's, that's not something that they would ever imagine happens to them. I didn't know how to talk to them. I just didn't know how to talk to them. And they, 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 had, they, they would be talking about past things, immediate past things within the last few years, and I would be, not know what it was. And I would start to talk to them, and their reaction was much different because they felt, oh, what the heck are you bragging about? It's, uh, they didn't get it. They had reasons for not going to war. They were not political reasons. They were not social reasons, they were just reasons that they felt they had better advantages by not going to war. All of those people had homes. They, they, they got married. They had contacts. We come out with no contacts. We had Spitfire pilots driving streetcars. That's how, that's, that's a fact. The opportunities were lost to a lot of people. And the, opportunities, the opportunities were gained by the people who stayed home. And that's, that was a sort of resented bitterness. I never felt that too much, you know, because I just figured I'm not going to be around here anyway. And uh, I went back to school in a forces rehabilitation course and got what they called a baccalaureate, but it was a half assed one because it was just a bring you back into society. And I did, did that on a sort of part-time basis because I was still learning journalism. But then I took off to France and I was in France for 16 months doing something totally romantic like steam angulation with Chateau Rothschild in Bordeaux. Learning a lot about wines, talking to people. and learning about the world, you know. I've hitchhiked all the way across this country twice, by the way, since I've been in Canada. When, when, uh, what years did you do that in? Well, actually, I did, the last time I did it, I was in my 40s. And what had happened is I belonged to an organization called the United Steelworkers of America, which I loved. I did the same job for them. I, I did the paper, did it just and things like that. But I decided to run against some of the top brass. And uh, they would fly all over the place. I had no money to fly all over the place. But I had a good team. So I arranged with people. When I say hitchhike, I managed to get trucks and stuff and all the way. Made contacts in every town all the way across. I lost, of course, but I, I made a good second. Scared the shit out of them. <laughs> I was in Thompson, Manitoba in January and uh, went, went from Winnipeg to Thompson, Manitoba in a Gadway, a Gadway truck, 700, 700 miles in the freezing cold. So I had a lot of experiences, met a lot of people. Never heard of Kitty Mat, but I found Kitty Mat. And it was coming from Ontario. And I knew that if I ever came west, I would never stay in Kitty Mat. No, no, they're the same. <coughs> they're the same. My daughter's, uh, my daughter's, uh, I'm so proud of her. We only have the one I'm so proud of her. She's, she'll email me and say, did you read the National Post or did you read the Globe and Mail this morning? And now I have, of course. And then she'll tell me what, what it was all about, you know. And this is like 10 o'clock in the morning and she's already read both of them while she's home. She's home now, she just got home from Japan actually and she's getting ready to go to Nassau to get another conference. But no, she's progressive. In a different sort of way. She's not politically progressive. She's progressive in the fact that she keeps her eye on world events, knows what's going on. And my wife, of course, has always been that way. That's why I married her. An interesting little story, which you don't have to record, but Back in 19, 
66. Back in 1972, when Joe was six years of age, in Hamilton, they had the women's movement, they had June Colwood, you probably heard of June Colwood, and Doris Sanderson, who was the editor of Chatelaine, and all these people who came around. Uh, Maud Barlow, these, they run the Voice of Women, all that stuff. And my wife got involved with this women's group and was took part in the first uh, International Women's Day meeting in Hamilton. So it was a big audience, about 600 people, 700 people in this convention center, maybe more, maybe a thousand people. And there was a lady who was going to read the poem, the famous poem of International Women's Day is called Bread and Roses. Give us bread, but give us roses. And the woman who was about to read it happened to look out of the state, side of the stage and saw this mass crowd and took cold feet. She'd never done that. She thought she was going to talk to a small audience. And my wife, who was standing there with my daughter, who was six, she said, Jill, you can read that. And she handed my daughter the paper. <laughs> As a six-year-old, Jill went out in front of that audience and read the poem perfectly. <laughs> So that tells you something. <laughs> and also the, another, you don't have to put this in, but another little aside to that is that uh, we always supported the, the NDP, and you don't have to put this in. And uh, Lincoln Alexander, who ended up being the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, and who was quite a good friend of mine, he was the MP in Hamilton, the Conservative MP. And he went to school. So my, would you like to ask Mr. Alexander, this is kindergarten, not kindergarten, but yeah, yeah primary school. Did, would you like to ask Mr. Anyone like to ask Mr. Alexander a question? And uh, Joe put up her hand and he says, what is the question? She said, why do you not support the poor people? <laughs> he didn't know what to say. He found out who she was, he says, oh, she must have got that from her father. She didn't, she got it from her mother. She says, why do we not support Mr. Alexander? And Rose, the best way to say it is that, well, he doesn't really support the things we believe in, like helping the poor and stuff like that. <laughs> so she, she had him with it. <laughs> <clears throat>the school. We were both sea cadets in Glasgow and we both came together to the to the signal school in Campbellton. We were both proficient in visual signaling and we competed with each other all the time. Jimmy and I were good friends. Anyway, he in the, in the tests and examinations Jimmy came first and I came second. And so we were in the barracks one night, we call it a ship, and they called out his name, Sigmund Bell, blah, 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 his number. And they called it three times and then they realised he wasn't aboard, he wasn't, he was out. And leave, sure leave. And they called me, so I took the ship at sail the next morning, the last thing I saw was Jimmy in a jetty, waving his hand at me. But I think of Jimmy, you know, because he went, his ship, the ship I should have got, if he'd been in the barracks, went down on 10th of June, four days after D-Day, right off our mansion, France, was torpedoed by e-boats, and he didn't survive. So I think of Jimmy a lot, especially in Remembrance Day and other days. You can still see him. There's an old saying that's they never grow old, they don't grow old. You see them as you remember them, still a boy. So that, that's the one person. There's probably others I remember. But Jim I th think about a lot. The, the, people, the people aboard the ship that I got to know, it was like a potpourri of culture. Some of them had never used a knife and fork in their life, and others were ready to go into Oxford University and stuff like that. So you were all together. And by the time you had been aboard that ship for a few years, you all had, you'd all integrated. You all played chess, you all talked philosophy, you all shared. It was an education. 
It was a great, great experience as far as that went. And you learned a lot about them. You learned a lot about their families. You learned a lot, a lot about how they felt. And surprisingly, surprisingly, you, 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 you begin to see the flaws in your own character and recognize that the good in your character, you know? And that's different from when you start because you sort of look down on them and tough guys and stuff like that. I mean, I, I've known guys, I, kn I knew two people who were hanged during the war. And uh, one of them was a guy called Croft and he was hang hanged in Italy. He'd been aboard a ship with me, but he, he wasn't aboard in Italy. But he got into the black market and ran a truck through a gate and killed a guy and he was hanged military. Another person I know has done the same thing in the Far East. And they were regular guys that just got caught up in some stupid black market progress, you know. Also in civil life I, I knew a guy who went to the chair, so I knew that from working my working life. They were all good guys. No, I, I, I think a lot about people. No, everybody hated the officers. That was it. Little snotty nosed bastards, we used to call them, you know. They probably bought their commissions. But then there was others who were seamen, real seamen, you know, who were respected. But we all got on all right. There was, the, you, you, you said, it all got together when you had to play soccer or do something like that, you know, things like that. But there was no real class divisions aboard the ship. It would have been crazy to think that, you know, since we were all in the same boat, literally. You know, as far as it, sinking or swimming. We had, well, we had lots of, lots of great, great conversations, lots of fun. A lot of us were sorry that it ever ended. I mean, I'm going to tell you that right away, because it's like breaking off a lifelong friendship. Never seen them again. We had a reunion, had a reunion of, uh, of the outfit, not just my ship, a reunion of the organization, Deep Sea Rescue Association, and I attended that. And uh, I came to that for three, three different years, going back to the, to the UK, three different times. And then it's disbanded because they've all gone now. And I belong to the Normandy Veterans Association. And now that's gone, there's only six of us left. You know, I feel like a dinosaur now, in some ways. And remember this day I marched. There was only two Second World War vets marched in Veterans Day. All the others sat at the cenotaph, you know. Wouldn't march. That might be my last time too. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a, a lot of difference between veterans. And we all have our own different ideas on what the war was about. And many of them got it from newspapers and propaganda stories after the war and not that I'm different but I got mine from experience I saw that I saw the results of it and if they did they didn't they didn't notice it yeah. I'm quite sure that while I while my mother was Running, helped to run a cafeteria for refugees. Many of my friends at that time in the services were saying we, should, we shouldn't be letting them into the country that's got them. So we had differences, differences. Same today, same today. Before I went into the Navy, I had different opinions. I mean, I knew his political life. He switched from Tories to Liberals, Tories to Liberals, ran in England, ran in Scotland. No, no, I, he, he, he was an opportunist. 
but then a lot of them are. I mean, Nelson Mandela was also an opportunist. I was surprised that people who know that. Yeah, I know Churchill was, and the great No, I, I kind of, he did, I suppose he did some good, you know. They tell me he was a good painter, a good bricklayer, but didn't have a good idea in his head. He was an imperialist, he was a swashbuckling guy, wanted to. And he proved it in the Dardanelles and he proved it in the war. And he, when, when, the, when the, I always remember reading, I was over here by then, I always remember reading that when the king died, King George VI, and Queen Elizabeth had to, Princess Elizabeth had to come back. He made a statement, he says, we have a revival of the Elizabethan age, the great mercantile age. Well, it was a great mercantile age of Queen Elizabeth. You know, Walter Raleigh and these people, they discovered the colonies and everything else. For Sir Francis Drake. So Churchill saw another Elizabeth, another imperial. Yeah. He lived in, he lived altogether in the past. All together in the past. Now I have very strong views about him. But then he's not doing me any harm. He did a lot of harm as a politician before the war. But he's not doing any. He did a lot of po and he continued on with the labour programs after the war. He had to, you know, he had to keep the national health. But you see, I'm not the only one who feels that way. It was, the, it was the services vote that defeated Winston Churchill in 1945. He was the prime minister of a coalition. He was never elected prime minister during the war. And when the war ended and we got back to normal elections, he was wiped out. And the reason he was wiped out is because people like me were voting for the first time who had heard about him and knew about him before the war. And that's why he got defeated. The fo it was, they always say, why did the forces turn on Churchill? Well, the forces never turned on Churchill. They turned on his ideas. And, it, and as a plagiarist too, you know, he, he was given credit for sorts, all sorts of things during the war in great saints and he plagiarized everything. But he admitted it, he admitted it. During the war, you know, we had newspaper magnates, Lord Beaverbrook, who ran the Daily Express, and Lord Kemsley, who ran all the daily records and all the rest of it. And Churchill had both of them in his publicity committee. So the, all of the newspapers in Britain were being aborted by these two guys. And even even at the time of the abdication, prior to the abdication, the British people didn't know anything about King Edward, uh, and, uh, about the Prince of Wales and Mrs. Simpson, while the people in America and all over the world knew about it for a year because we censored the news coming in and Churchill was responsible for that. No, he was an opportunist. I, I feel very strong that was a wrong decision, and uh, it was it was uh, the times. You're a his, you're a, you're a historian, so you know that when the war ended in Europe, Russia took advantage of declaring war in Japan, and Russia and Japan had been at war many years before. Him. Else. And Russia brought down her Black Sea fleet to Vladivostok, which is in the Orient, close to Japan. And Russia had literally turned out to have the greatest army of the war. That's what defeated the Germans, not the Americans. And I think they were afraid that Russia was going to make a move on Japan. And they had to stop it. 
And that's why I believe he dropped out of bomb. I'm not alone in that opinion. Because the atom bomb was to destroy people. They say that we still have veterans, I hear, have to discuss it with them all the time. And it's, uh, no, the atom bomb was to prevent, to save lives of Okanaka. Well, the atom bomb nothing to do with slave life. We come from, a, we came from a country that didn't give a damn about lives. They slaughtered millions of people in the First World War and they slaughtered millions of people in the Second World War. So why all of a sudden would we care for some Japanese lives? No, the atom bomb was dropped deliberately to stop Russia. Totally political. I can't say that, but people have forgotten about it. I think people have forgotten about a lot of things in, in society. You know, we're now, we're now back to tribalism in that sense. We have no longer, as John Porter said, there's the vertical mosaic, you know. We have a mosaic of cultures now, and you talk about multiculturalism, we don't have multiculturalism, we have multicultures, all doing their own thing and all having their own beliefs. Uh, I mean, really, today, we're seeing evidence of it. We just saw evidence of it in Quebec, where they actually declared an anti-Muslim law. You know, who ever heard of an anti-Muslim law and a... Hitler had an anti-Jewish policy. They have an anti-Muslim policy, but we've, we've got it here too. I, I, you've heard it, you've... Everyone's heard it. And that's sad. That's sad. You no longer can see the lady looking out and seeing the kids playing in the meadow of all cultures and creeds. That no longer happens. When I'm doing this post and essay con contest that I've talked to you about, I'm dealing with the school kids in West Vancouver. I'm not dealing with kids who grew up in a pro-British society. I'm looking at kids who grew up all over the place. They actually have no idea what the First World War was like because they were not involved in the First World War. They were indirectly, but not to the extent of fighting in France, things like that. And they have a different slant in life, a different outlook on life than the kids of people who were brought up in this culture. And I don't know how we're ever going to change that. The kids themselves will change it because they, they integrate, but I, I don't know how I don't know how they'll feel in ten years down the road. Because all the kids that I was at school with, we we thought it was great to have this variety of cultures coming over from Europe. When, oh, I was playing with a German boy today, I was playing with a Jewish kid today. But the same people, 10 years later, were saying he's goddamn Jews, he's German. I don't know how they like. It's hard to say, and I'm not about to try and figure it out. No, 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 it's, it, it's a very complex society. And to try and give an opinion on how society will be in a year or two years, who would ever have thought that society would be the society we have today 10 years ago? Very difficult. And people change according to the, the economics. They change according to what is happening around them. The guy who, the guy who works in an auto plant and getting a good life, a good life for his family, and then gets laid off, becomes a different person altogether. He starts turning on his own workmates. I, I've seen that too.
Anyway, you think deep. You think deep. Well, first of all, they have to understand it. it's not as romantic as they think. I've said that many times. And they also have to understand that war is an industry. War is, war is not, not the way it used to be in the days of old and when people were supposed to be chivalrous and gallant. War today is industry. We will be building, spending hundreds and hundreds of million dollars to build war machines that will be obsolete in our time but to give us the right to build more war, war machines, and we're doing that, and never using them. We're in, an, we're in an age where, I think I read the other day that the United States and Russia have something like 400 atom bombs between them, in different places all over the world. That's scary. And uh, I don't know how young people conceive this at all. They, they once described the UK, a guy wrote a book actually about the UK and called it the biggest aircraft carrier in the world. And this was in 1960 because of the American bases in the UK. Now, they have, you, you probably know this, they have submarines in Scotland, American submarines in Scotland. They have American planes in Scotland. They have American planes in Germany. They have American planes. They have British planes in Germany. We're all over the world now. And the reason we're all over the world is because it's economic sound for us to be there. We're all part of agreements and trade agreements. But, but war is an industry. It's an industry. The, the war machine, weapons. We have, we have a situation where Russia is supplying weapons to Syria. While Syria is using these weapons to fight their own people. With the United States supplying weapons to other countries, we are supplying weapons to other countries. Chinese are supplying weapons to our countries. It's an industry. No, 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 no. There was a build, building up of your own forces. In 1939, when, we, when the UK went to war, they were training the soldiers with broomsticks, you know? And I've always said that had it been in 1938 when Neville Chamberlain said, peace in our time, then Neville Chamberlain saved the world. Because had we been as rambunctious as Churchill wanted us to jump in there and fight them right away with no weapons, but that's imperialism. Wave the sword into the valley of death goes the gallant 600, you know. The only people who didn't believe they were gallant 600 were the gallant 600. No. No, war was much war is much different. I don't know who to anymore what to believe. Who is who? There are war lead war leaders today that We, are, we, we support Israel over Palestine. And yet, at the end of the war, we were supporting Palestine to keep the Jews out of Israel. Immigrant ships, we call them. So we, we flipped over. It was economically sound to support Israel. Economically sound. I don't know. It's you get a hundred different people, you get a hundred different answers to that question. In, 
during the Cold War. I think I gave you an example of Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela went to jail for 27 years. And the people who kept him in jail released him from jail and gave him the Nobel Prize. Because it was now, the world was now changing. We needed to show that we too were against apartheid. Because we were for apartheid all the time he was for 27 years he was in jail. Because we believed that the blacks of South Africa should be treated like the blacks of the southern states. We are still being treated that way. In this, in this great continent of ours, we still treat black people the way we treated black people during the, during the slave times. In Alabama, Mississippi, I don't know if you've been there, but my God, that, the racism. And, and, and they show it. I mean, we have a president of the United States who is a friend with the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. If that's not the American president of the United States saying he believes in racism, what is? I don't know. I don't have to figure it out either, thank God. <coughs> I would say the young people in response to society and response to humanity uh, having res re being responsible for the country means obeying the laws of the country recognizing the rights that they have fight, fighting for the rights they don't have or fighting for any rights they think they should have very interesting you know I belong to the Royal Canadian Legion and uh, you know that in our constitution, if you're a communist, you can't be a member of the Royal Canadian Legion. But if you're a communist, you can live in Canada because we have a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And we have communists who run for elections and are allowed to run, they run for elections. But the Royal Canadian Legion is an institution where we still fight the Cold War. We still say that communism is evil. Maybe it is, I don't know. I know that, ter I know that totalitarianism is evil. I wouldn't put it down to communism. I mean, as a, as a person who claims to have read before he re reads before he jumps into any conclusions, the, the Communist Manifesto and Karl Marx makes a lot of sense. I mean, Karl Marx wrote one book called Future Society, worth reading, in which he says, we should not punish crime until we punish the society which engenders crime. Now, I believe that. We have a society which engenders crime. That's why we have so many lawyers. Because we have a society which engenders crime. Mein Kampf, again, that was a, a, a radical rambling. But Hitler was not an idiot, you know. He was not an idiot. I wouldn't advise, I wouldn't put Mein Kampf in the same class as, a, as a Karl Marx. Karl Marx wrote much more than the Communist Manifesto, Friedrich Engels, all of them. But they came from a different time. And you've got to, you've got to recognize the times. There's a whole different outlook today. We see, I mentioned to you before that I crossed the bridge with my father and saw a guy sitting there begging. Well, he wasn't begging, he, he was digni dignified. He was drawn in the street, he had a cab, and you could throw money in to help him buy cranes. That's all he was asking to do. But he wanted that money to feed himself, not to buy cranes, but his dignity. Give me an apple, stuff like that. 
We see the same thing today. People in the street, but they're not giving away anything. They're begging for things. And we look on them as a sort of from a distance, we, we don't want to. But not once do I, have I seen people stop and have a conversation with them. I have. I, I've talked to quite a few of them. And they all recognize why they're there. They, they, they're screwed up. They tell you. I talked to one guy, as a, as a matter of fact, I sat down beside him <laughs> down in Granville Street. And he, he had his PhD. Well, he was a PhD candidate. He didn't have it. He, he gave up. And he got caught up. Caught up in drugs and booze. And stole some money, went to jail for a little while. He told me all about it. He says, and he puts down in, he puts down in his papers that he's got his BA and his MA and he was a PhD candidate, but he also puts down that he was incarcerated. And incarceration trumps everything else and he can't get a job. That's wrong. If he doesn't put incarceration down, and they find out, he gets fired. And he gets fired for not being truthful. So that goes on to his next record, stand. We, we don't know how to treat people. And we treat all the wrong people all the r r wrong people rightly and the right people wrongly. Yeah. It's difficult to talk to me about young people today because the young people I see today are, are nice, clean young people. But their values are all screwed up, you know? They, they have money to burn. In this, society, in this town anyway, they have money to burn. I hear them at night, and I, the, the other night I came, I was over at the Orpheum, and I got out after 10 o'clock, so I got the bus home, and it was after 11 o'clock. <laughs> I got off the bus at 17th Street, and four Porsches, come flying past me like 200 miles an hour. And all kids are in them, kids. I can't relate to kids like that, you know? So, so, so I don't know. But I have, I have lots of faith in the young people because you, that's, that's our future. And, and so, there's got to be, a number of them who are going to make it better. And a number who don't care. And the ones who don't care are better than the ones who make it worse. Yeah, well, as I said earlier, I think we're predators, you know. Human beings don't fight wars. If you really get right down to it, Wars become a, a part of humanity. And as I say, we are predators. So it just feels that we have to fight wars. I don't understand why we're fighting wars. I don't understand what this ISIS is. I don't know who's in it, and nobody knows who's in it. I don't understand why War has changed as it has. It's no longer tanks. It is tanks, but that's not, it's not only tanks. It's, it's but vans and trucks loaded with explosives driving into civilians. There's, po there's possibly more civilians being killed today than there is soldiers. When you think of the number of people in Bangladesh right now, and the number of people in Syria, number of people all over the world, civilians are soldiers. And they're being killed by
by strange means. They've been killed by guns, they've been killed by people blowing themselves up in restaurants and cafes and I don't understand it. It's like, it's like there's a, a wish to kill, a wish to die for the people you're killing, you know? I, I don't think I can answer that question. They, they take an interest in their country and they start, they start paying attention to what's happening. Most people do not pay attention. They, they, they take it for granted that there's going to be something happening in the news tonight. They're going to turn on the news tonight and somebody's going to blow up something somewhere. The, the Russians are going to invade. The, the Russians are going to fight the Ukrainians. The, Ukrainians are going to retaliate against the Bosnians or whoever the hell they are. And it's all, it's all like a cultural, religious jihad. And I, I, I don't even understand it. It's, I mean, we, take, we, we send troops to Iran. We'll send 10,000 troops to Iran, and then the next month we decide that we'll pull 10,000 troops out of Iran. You know, I don't understand it. As I say, it's an industry, and you have to put the workers where the game is. That's all. But young people, and I, again, when I, when I was young, as I said, we knew what we were fighting for against. How do you expect young people to stop war when they don't know what the hell it's all about? I would say that they, they don't want to see people being blown up. They don't want violence. So they, they want to stop violence. But how are they going to do it? Ask the young people. Ask them what they want. Don't ask me. If I was a young, if I was a young man today, I really wouldn't know what to do. I see young, young guys join the army, that's fine. But the, even the army today is different. The army is not advertising, come and join, join up to fight the Russians or fight somebody else. The army is advertising today to say, join the army and learn a trade. I'm all for that. Join the army and learn how to be a plumber, that's okay. But I don't know. I'd like to hear how, how young people feel about that. Interview some of the young people and ask them how they feel about how could you stop war. The answer is you'll never stop war. But let's have a whack at it. Of course, of course, if you don't protest, then you've got to bring it to somebody's attention. Otherwise, it'll just die out. The only thing I have against it is that many people take advantage of it. For example, I went on a, an anti-war thing in Vancouver with a number of people from West Vancouver. We went over there. And in the parade, there was women's rape center. Men, men are evil, men fight against wars, stop rape, stop this. They take advantage of it and they, they become just a big mass and people don't know what it's all about. They just think it's a, a bunch of nuts all. That, that, that's what I'm finding with parades. The parades that I used to go into, everybody carried a sign that talked about why we were there. But now you go into this, they don't know why they're there. And it's, it's a fun day, blow horns and whistles and stuff like that. And it, it loses its effect. It's just, just a nuisance, you know? And you actually, a person who is in there for a legitimate reason actually 
feels that he shouldn't be there when you're walking down there protesting war in Iran or Iraq and the guy behind you has got a sign that says legalize marijuana. You know, the crowd see that, they don't see your sign. So I, I, I demonstrate less and less now. <coughs> We should have an anti-war, make it an anti-war movement. That's if you believe in anti-war, you take part in an anti-war movement. To be anti-war and legalize marijuana, I, I, I'm in favor of both these things, you know? But I don't think we should be marching together, you know? I'm talking about the anti-war parades now. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, that kind of confusion, conglomeration of all the different... And the Women's Rape Centre, yeah. you know, what, all, all these signs. And, and I'm, a, I'm opposed to rape. I support the Women's Rape Centre, but I don't want a sign carried by them saying men are evil, you know, things like that. I came into the world in peace and I wanted to leave it in peace. And I want to eliminate poverty. I want to see all the good things that I believe in. I want mankind to recognize humanity, I think that's it. That sounds philosophical, but that's what I believe in. Yeah. Just being good, just being good. Love thy neighbor, that's the best thing to say. Yeah, I can't answer that, but my legacy would be, I just, I just want people to say that he wasn't a bad guy, you know? Or they can say oh, he was an ass, I don't care, but <laughs> people from the side that don't believe me think that anyway, so that's, but I'd just like to think that I didn't do anybody any harm. Willfully do harm to anybody. Everyone does somebody harm at some time, but I willfully, not willfully. No. I've actually got to the point now where I don't read newspapers anymore. You know? I'm sad to say that, but that's because of my failing eyes, you know. I find it's easier to get all my information from my daughter or from other people. And, and, and of course, I watch the news programs. I listen to NPR, which is a good station to get things with. Do you listen to NPR? Yeah. I figure it's a good station. But... Uh, I can't read the North Shore News because the print is too small. So. These are the failures in life, you know, the physical things, you know, you know even with glasses. It's, it's, so I get to the point now, the newspaper has become some, the big print, is, they should get big print newspapers, but they wouldn't sell. The newspapers are going down, there'll be no newspapers in a few years. I was just heard that last night, actually, that uh, the amalgamation of the National Post and the Toronto Star, eh? Terrible. Two totally different philosophies. How, how, what sort of editorials are they going to write? I grew up in a time uh, I grew up in a time when, uh, have you ever heard of pipe clay? I don't know that I have. Okay. Well, this is a bar, it's like a bar of soap, only it's chalk. And it's made, of, it's called pipe clay. There was a special clay that was manufactured in the old days for pipes. 
You can buy a clay pipe for a penny and put tobacco in it and workers did this, you know, by people. So, so they were using their good briars and stuff like that. And this was called pipe clay because it looked like chalk. Well, there was a crossroads where I lived. Was, I lived in a rural area and there was a crossroads and my father would go there or somebody else who was involved in a meeting and he'd take this pipe clay so it's this thick and you'd write it that way so, so the writing is thick. Meeting tonight, 7 p.m. Summertime. So I said, at seven o'clock, there would be a cart, one of these carts that the horses pull. There's horses, these days, horses and carts. In the middle of the road, and whoever was calling the meeting would be speaking. And all the population would be around it. Everybody came. They, they came because it was a meeting. They didn't know what kind of meeting it was going to be until they got there. It could be a political meeting, it could be a religious meeting, but that was in the days when people were interested in communications. They wanted to know what was going on. Now, we've got a meeting tonight at the, the Legion, it's an election night, and we'll be lucky if we can elect an executive. Nobody, nobody comes to meetings anymore. Same in the library. <laughs> yeah, there's a, Pamela Goldsmith-Jones holds a meeting here, and all the people that come, are, are the local liberal association. So why do you need a meeting? You, you know what's going to be said, you know what it's all about. My father was like that. He, my father believed that, why should I be reading the left wing press when I know what the left wing is doing? and taught me that, you read the right-wing press. You don't need to read the left-wing press. I mean, if you're a communist, you don't have to read Marx, you'd read Adam Smith, you know? Find out why you're a communist. I bordered on it one time, I actually thought about joining the Communist Party because I had a lot of buddies who were in the Communist Party. And during the war, you know, the whole of the population of the UK was wearing a red star and opened the second front for the Russians, you know. And communism, they thought the Russians were great during the war. But I bordered on it once because I went to so many meetings of the Communist Party, like public meetings, and listened to all the speakers and boy they had some great speakers. They, they knew what they were talking about. And they came from all walks, you know. They came from university professors to shipyard workers, but they were all smart. Knew exactly what was going on. And of course, un unfortunately communism, as I'm talking about it, has, is totally distorted by totalitarianism, you know. Well, I bothered them at one time. I thought, boy, they're smart people. They're saying all the right things. And the Tories, the Liberals, the NDP, whatever, I listened to them all because they're all saying the same things. Today, they're all saying the same things in different ways. It's all about money. Everything's about money. John Horgan, a new NDP Prime Minister, he wants to go to the NPS. The Liberals are saying that they want to modify the N NPS. Yeah. But <laughs> that's nothing philosophical in parties anymore. And that's because they have to, they have to work with society now. Yeah. After the war, I, I went back to school, Glasgow University, I told you. And I was with this fella, 
called Tommy Wilkinson. And Tommy was interested in taking a business course. He was into management, stuff like that. He was doing good. And he kept applying for jobs. He came from a place called Rose Street in the Garbles of Glasgow, which was like the Bowery of New York. And he kept getting turned down, so he came to my father. He came to me, actually, first, and asked my father if when he was sending his letters and his applications, could he use our address? Now, we weren't millionaires, but we were pretty okay. My father was a professional guy, he was an engineer, civil engineer. And we did that. And on his first application, he got an interview. And that guy, when I left the, the UK, was the general manager of Mackinson Stout. See? Now, that's, that's in a nutshell what the UK was like. They looked at your address. When I applied for a course, in Hamilton, shortly after I came here. So I just came to Hamilton. I just wanted to get in and do a, get a student card and get a course. I wasn't going to stay in it, it was just the adult education. And this is back in the 50s. One of the questions was, has any other member of your family attended university? Well, my father did, my mother did. And I answered that. And I was wrong to answer that, because that was a class question. The son of a doctor can get into medical school, even if he's stupid, than the son of a laborer who's a genius. And I found that out in this country. That's what I talked about, it was the same class system. I don't know if it's the same today. You're in the university, I don't know if it's the same today. library well. So I get interested in the library because my mother was an art teacher and uh, she was one of those progressive women, as I said before, who w went back to work after she had her children, and w like the women do today, which was totally different to anything in her, her group. And uh, she used to have to do some schools in Glasgow on a Thursday, she, in art inspecting type things, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, that was what she was doing. So she'd get the train from Thornley Bank and she'd drop us off at Pollock Shaw's railway station. And my grandfather would be there to meet us because he was retiring then. Uh, pretty well semi-retired, but he was getting retired. And he would meet us and he'd take us up to my grandmother's and my young sister, two of us. She would stay with my grandmother and my grandfather would have lunch and then after lunch would take the dog my grandfather and myself down to the pub. My grandfather would get in the pub, and I'd get in the pub with him. The dog would stay outside. Just lie down, I knew it. Yeah. And we'd get in the pub. In those days, the pubs closed at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and opened again at 5. It was a stu stupid Scottish loss. But we'd be in there from well, 1 o'clock with all the men, and I loved it. They used to take me and sit me in the end of the bar, right on the bar. And Jim Drone was the bartender and he'd give me a little glass of beer. And I loved the colour of that. Ushers, pale ale, I always remember it. Like. And I'd watch all these men, and they were mostly like my grandfather, a lot of sea captains, a lot of seamen. They all had suits, ties, and watches, and they smoked pipes, and they all cut their tobacco, shaved their tobacco, and pass it to each other, and share each other's tobacco. And I loved the smells, I loved everything about it. But right across the road from this pub was uh, the library, the Stirling Library. And it was up, it was like in a building above a fruit shop type of thing. It was a small area. But Miss Laidlaw was a librarian. So one day she came out and she said to my grandfather, you know, I've been watching you taking this child into that pub. She said, I, I know there's nothing wrong with that, but she said, it's not a good environment for having a child. 
She said, so when you come down here with the dog, she says, go in and talk with your friends, leave him with me in the library. Okay. So that's what they did. And I, I didn't care for that at the time. I used to sit on the floor and she'd give me those two cards. There was a red card and a blue card. The red card, you had to take a fiction book and the blue card, you had to take a non-fiction book. You had to take two and put the cards into slots and everything. So she showed me how to do that and sit with her. I used to look, sit on the floor and she sat in a high chair like one of your school teachers' chairs. All I used to see was a different colour of bloomers she wore every day, you know, and all that stuff. And I sat there. So when people say to me, how did you first get interest in the library? I say, I got interest in the library to get me off the beer. At four years of age. But I was, and, I, and it was great. She taught me everything about books, and she'd tell me stories, read this, read that. So I was always in, in library, as far as I'm concerned, librarians are the salt of the earth. I made a speech here when they changed that thing outside to the, the, the flag, you know. And uh, Anne Goodhart was the chairman in town. I made a speech and I said that, that it was librarians to fight censorship. My brains keep us honest. It's like the abbeys, you know. There's no burning of the books when there's librarians around. I've always had a great affinity for librarians. Librarians, miners, and court miners, and seamen, you know. What happened was after the war, before, war, before the war in Europe had been declared, it had also been on the books that we were going to go to the Far East for the end of the Japanese campaign. So we were in deep sea rescue tells. And so we started off to get out there, but the war was ending. But we, they just kept us, they wanted us out there anyway for a station. So we traveled out there to the Far East. And while we were in the Far East, we operated as, as a man of war with the Navy, because there was all sorts of unrest going on. There was unrest in Burma then, there was unrest in India, there was unrest in Malaya, and there was unrest everywhere. Because after the war, for some reason, it's like, not just me in my mind not want to return to imperialism. The, the people of Malaya didn't want to return to imperialism. So they separated Singapore, Malaya, with two different entities then. And they separated, so we were stationed in Singapore quite a bit. We went around to Hong Kong, same things there, there's a lot of unrest by Zagabatan in India, Kolkata, Bombay, and Bombay were in there during the time. Because remember now, we're talking now, we have went out there at the end of 45, it's now gone all 46, we're getting into 47, India's going to have separation, so everything was happening. So, from my demo, you get a demob number in the Navy, you know, and when your demob number comes up, that means you get demobilized, you, you go home. Well, any, many of the guys who were on our ships were deciding to go home, demobilize and leave the ship. So they'd leave the ship, they'd go into barracks in one of the countries, Singapore, Hong Kong, wherever they were, and then they would, so they, they'd keep in touch with us. So two, three months later, they're still writing to me from the barracks, they're waiting on a ship and all the rest of it to go home, and they're going to, some of them were going to the Golden Hind in Australia, that was a big demobilization place for the Pacific fleet, and they were still there. So when my mobilization number came up, I decided, hell, I'm gonna stay with the ship because it's going back within a year, and these guys, it may take me that long to go, to go there. So th instead of going back, well, fast with my ship, I hit every war that was going on in the bloody world on the way home. Even coming through the Suez Canal, when I thought, well, thank God we're in the Mediterranean now, there's nothing happening up here, we're going to go home. We ended up 
fighting to uh, these immigrants, uh, illegal Jewish immigrant ships going into Israel, we had to fight and turn them back and take them to Cyprus. And that, that's what I was talking about. So it was, it was an experience going back because the world was changing and we were, we were now involved in the politics of the world rather than the war of the world, you know. And I got home in January 1947 and uh, I actually started, my demob number came up in November 1945. <laughs> So I met, met, met a lot of strange conditions that I never thought I would meet. I was in, was in a place called Trivandrum. That's in the tip of India, the French part of India. It was at one time Trivandrum. And uh, met guys who actually had machetes who were waiting for us to come ashore. <laughs> Machetes. Because we were showing the British flag. The British flag's a butcher's apron, you know. It's not respected all over the places it's been. And the American flag's becoming a butcher's apron too. And the Canadian flag is getting that way, you know. We're not, we're now treated like Americans, you know. God, I was always an anti-imperialist. Yeah. Always. Oh, yeah, shit. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the, nothing makes sense. You see, you've heard of Culloden in Scotland, eh? For the English massacred the Highlanders. And this idiot, Bloody Prince Charlie, the Polish-born pretender, got away. Well, the guy who read that, who re led the raid against and slaughtered everybody in Clarden, is hated. He was a Colonel Wolf. But over here, he's loved because he was a General Wolf. Same guy. That's imperialism. It was a case of swashbuckling. Churchill was a, a swashbuckler. Not that I'm aware of, no. No, I, you know, we went alongside the, one of these old rusty ships that was bringing the Jews into Israel from Europe, illegal they were. And we went alongside, we're going to them, and they were dropping their piss pots and their shit pots on us, you know. So a lot of people turned anti-Semitic in those days, but they figured that's the way they lived. But no, I, I, I figured we'd have done the same. Throwing shit at us. And then, of course, uh, trying to think of a hotel in Haifa. St. David's? King David. King David Hotel Haifa for them executed the British soldiers, hanged them all, the British soldiers. So that, these things were happening. But then, they were resisting us, like they hadn't resisted Hitler. And they've turned into one of the biggest war states in the world now. They've got more weapons and tanks in the Middle East than anybody. My wife's friend, Tova, a Jewish girl in Hamilton, Tova. My wife actually thought I'd be going to a kibbutz before I met her because of Tova. But Tova's brother was flying a jet plane when I, and this is back in the late 50s, was starting to fly a fighter in Israel. And I says, in Israel? What the hell am I doing with fighters in Israel? So the shelter, within 10 years of being coming out of 
Belsen and Dachau and places like that and Auschwitz that were already preparing to fight other downtrodden people. That's the thing I have never understood. Again, that's a religious war. Muslims and Jews. Don't try and figure it out, you'll go nuts. Not today, I don't think, but in Marx's time, I certainly thought Marx, Marx had, the, had the idea. You see, Marx never thought that communism would start in Russia. He always thought it would start in America. Because America was, Marx was talking about the exploitation of workers, exploitation of people, and there was more going on for that in the United States than there was in the Soviet Union, because the so there was no Soviet Union, first of all. It was Imperial Russia. And he wasn't, Marx wasn't fighting feudalism, he was fighting industrialization. It was during industrialization that he wrote the Communist Manifesto. The world was already screwed up with feudalism and imperialism. He was talking about the new societies and how the new societies should progress. And a lot of it came from the Bible, a lot of it came from mythology, from other, other things. Greek mythology and stuff like that in and, and history. But it was possible it could have worked. It was misrepresented by people who were opposed to capitalism. See, one of the things that, if you really, if you really want to sound a, a wee bit oddball in, in a lot of ways, you say to yourself, why are they against it? When they're so bad, that must be good. And if capitalism is so great and they're against communism as a threat to capitalism, why are they so against it that they're spending all their time fighting it? Because if capitalism is so great, you don't have to worry about it. So they, they were, the cracks that were taking place in capitalism were being exploited by the, people, by the Marxists. Cuba, for example. Now, I don't know, I, 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 I've met, I met Castro, by the way, and I met them because I went to a conference that was called the World Federation of Trade Unions, 1982. I, I, I attended that. And the, the World Federation of Trade Unions was actually embraced all trade unions in the world. But right after the Second World War, when they realized that many of the people in the WFTU were socialists from Britain and communists, and Australia had a big part in it. George Meany, who's the president of the American Federation of Labor, decided that there's no way America is going to get involved with this group because we're fight, going to fight communism. This is the start of the Cold War. So they created a new organization, no, no longer called the WFTU, they called it the ICFTU, International Confederation of Free Trade Unions. And so when WFTU at its conference in Havana, we were not part of that. But Dennis McDermott, you may have heard of him, who was the president of CLC at the time, Dennis McDermott said we should have some observers there. So he said we'll send Harry because Harry doesn't give a shit about being called a communist or anything like that. So I went down with two or three others. And uh, we met Castro. We, we saw the, the, the school system, the kids in schools and the medical system and everything they were trying to get was great. I don't know what was happening in the jails or the politics saying that. But I'll tell you this, they were progressing. They were progressing. And we were in, a, we were in a, a great big compound. It was a beautiful compound built by, by a castle. And the Russians were still part of helping Cuba at that time because nobody else was doing it after the BFX. And then I saw, even there, the, there was a class system. 
because when we were there, we stayed in the Hotel Libre. It used to be called the Hotel Hilton, you know? And it's called the Hotel Libre. Big, big thing in Havana, big hotel in Havana at that time. And we had interpreters, mostly students, interpreting, taking us around and stuff like that. Then in the last couple of nights, we had a great big reception out in this beautiful compound. And none of the interpreter, none of the kids were there. I says, where's so-and-so, where's so-and-so? Well, they didn't make it. But all the wives of the diplomats and all the rest of it were there to take up the place as interpreters. They introduced themselves at the place as interpreters, they couldn't. So I, I, I saw that, it's pretty shitty. After all the great things we'd seen, I thought that was pretty shitty. But when I met Castro, it was interesting because we were told that he would shake hands with him. You could ask him a question, but try not to get too political. And just ask him about what you're here to see, you know, progress and stuff like that. And the reason for this conference, it was 10 years after the, the, the WFTU had been founded, actually. No, it was 40 years after it had been founded. But the reason we were there is because Cuba was going to join the WFTU. And Canada, we weren't part of it either, we were just observers. But the thing about it was, How all of those people had visions of a society. And that was Marxism and communism. And the kids in school were all dressed nice. They said, I don't know what's happened to the rest. We met all the workers, we met cigar makers. But anyway, I had to ask us a question. So I just, as you're going to Havana Harbor, have you been to Cuba? Well, as you're going to Havana Harbor, there's a great big statue of Jesus Christ doing the Sermon on the Mount. It's been there from, it's a Catholic country, you know. And I said to him, that it's interesting because the concept of people outside of Cuba is that Cuba is not religious. And yet, entering Havana Harbor, you see a great big statue of Jesus Christ at the entrance to Havana Harbor. He goes like that. It's at the exit. We don't need it in here. You need religion out there, you don't need it in here. We've got communism. That's what you're saying. But it was the way he did it. Is that the exit? He's a big guy. Yeah. And, I, and I never saw him in all the fatigues that you see him in. He wore a suit the whole conference, you know? Just look. Yeah, it was an interesting time. Yeah. A lot of people in that job, because because there's still the, the union has seven million people in the states and it's and it's all over. During the 1967 67 riots in Chicago, you know the big thing. Hubert Humphrey was running for president, and I I was we had our con we had our convention delegates all there because we would support the Democrats, and I was just there. Uh, and my credentials are the United Steelworkers Press Association, so I'm standing up front. So uh, Hubert Humphrey's campaign manager was a guy called Ed Murchie. And uh, he was there. So we're getting ready for this, we're in the scrum. And I got a hit in the shoulder with this big camera, NBC camera. 
And I said, what the fuck? And I turned round and it was Sam Donaldson who was on the other end of the, who was a journalist, to tell me to get in the camera. But Murchie turned round and glared at me, you know, because he'd heard it. Humphrey too. But then he saw the United Steel Workers say, so I was standing there. And then Marty introduced Hubert Humphrey. He says, we'll take the questions. He says, the first question will take us from Mr. Greenwood. See? Donaldson, I said, who the hell is he? And I said, seven million votes, that's who I am. <laughs> and I had nothing to ask. So I asked about acid rain because that was the predominant thing between Canada and the States those days. And he said, oh, you must be Canadian. <laughs> yeah, got a lot of nice little experiences and things like that. Not, a, not at all. Not at all. Censorship is censorship. You can't pick and choose. If you start picking and choosing, you're, you're all over the place. We had an incident here when Anne Goodhart was, the, was the, the director, and she was before Jenny. And somebody complained that we had a gay and lesbian newspaper on the stand outside there. I think we still have, don't we? I believe so. Yeah. And, uh, she brought it to the board and she said that uh, she assured the guy that they would be removed and I says, like hell they will, they'll stay there. So you see, there was an incident where she would have caused a great big fracas here by doing that. Anything you do to in censorship, you've got to be 100% clear. You either censor it, censor everything, or don't censor anything. You can't censor everything. The only people that censored everything was the services during the war. They read your letters and all that stuff. So you found, found ways of getting around things, you know. Say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to visit my uncle Joe. It means you were going to go to convoy to Russia or something like that. No, no, I, I, I'm totally opposed to any kind of censorship. You can be opposed to what's been said, but you don't cut it out, you know? I mean, you, half the things you read, you get opposed to. And wonder why they get into the newspapers in the first place. Just a few weeks ago, I think it was only last week, there was a whole front page of the North Shore News about a guy who had received France's highest honour? Yes. You saw that? Well, many of us got it three years ago. And it went without any mention. And they we were calling up the Legion and saying, how come, what, what's so different between this and everybody else's? It was a, not only a front page spread, it was two pages front, 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 about a guy who never got over there until, they were in, until the war was a year after. So you see, as I, I could immediately get up in arms about that, but I thought, what the hell? Give the guy his break, you know? But half the, half the veterans were upset with that. And why, did, why was it in the paper in the first place that far along? He, he never left here until November 1944. Well, indeed, he was in... But there was still a war in France, you know? So I, I, I just come from newspaper and I, knew, I, knew, I know exactly where it's coming from, you know? The most important thing you have to learn in a newspaper, the proofreaders. You see a lot of mistakes in newspapers, and that's because 
proofreaders put in with the, what the reporter writes. All of us type like that, you know? And we make mistakes, we don't correct them. Well, if the proofreader catches it, good. That's why we don't correct them. But if he doesn't catch it, so he didn't catch it. It's, it's not the end of the world. But nobody can afford to miss an obituary or a marriage or a birth. That's proofread and proofread and proofread because somebody's paying for that. And that's, that's only one shot in the paper and they're paying for it. So the proofreader is there to check advertising and page and entries and anything else he doesn't give a shit about. And neither does the reporter. You learn a lot in these paper things. And, and uh, the thing too about the, about the, the press is that we had our international president on in television. It was at the time they were talking about some, something, steel, steel tariffs or something like that, and he was going on to explain it, what we thought about it. And before he went on, and this was in Pittsburgh, before, because that's the head office here. Before he went on, I says to him, I went over and I says to the guy, how long has he got? And he says, oh, we'll give him a, we'll give him a minute and 30 seconds. You know, they know, they've got their time figured out. So I went over to the president and I says, okay, when you go on there, you speak for a minute and 30 seconds and don't be diverted in any way. Speak for a minute and 30 seconds, because that's the only way you'll get your message out. If you start rambling all over the place, they'll cut everything as, as they go, because it's not live. They're, it's going on the news. The news is not live, you know that. Yes. So when, you, when you're dealing with media, you've got to realise that before anything goes on to that news, that they check it out, they, the lawyers check it out, the legal department checks it out, the newspapers, the legal department checks everything, you know, before it, before it even hits the streets. So there's no such thing as news. It's yesterday's or two hours ago or four hours ago. Yeah. Yes, anything, but I do. I do like openness, you know.